from Grooveview Studios in Columbus, Ohio, this is Getting the Brand Back Together, a podcast exploring the interdisciplinary art of banding, branding, and business building. Rock and roll relic, poet, writer, and brandist, I'm your host, Brad Cerconi. Today, we're joined by Greg Bartram, uh, who's a member of member services at Wheels Up and is formerly the bass player of The Toll. Welcome to the podcast, Greg. Why, thank you. This is my podcast voice, Bradley. I'll be speaking to you like this when I don't have a good answer to sound smarter. You always have a good answer. Today's topic is fascinating to me because you and I actually have never, all our years together, we've never really talked about this. And that is the idea of bass as uh, a brand. We're going to touch on some other things like business in the music business great brands that are around the country, some that you have been um, uh, fortunate enough and proud enough to work for, like Disney. But today I want to start off more, of course, in the rock and roll genre. I'd like to talk to you about, I guess the first question is bass as an instrument uh, in general, and then more specifically as uh, a concept, you know, um, and how does bass play into uh, music and songwriting? So, First, when you think of the instrument bass, what, what words come to mind if you're thinking about how do I define to the world? But how would you define, just using words, the brand of bass? I would say groove, rhythm, and passion. And I would say that because those are the sorts of players that have always attracted me, even when I was a guitar player and wasn't paying much attention to bass other than, you know, in an ancillary fashion. Right, and that's how you got started in bass was by, you, you were actually a guitar player in the beginning, right? And why don't you tell our listeners, first of all, I think it's fascinating the way you play bass, I think was influenced because of the background of guitar, which we're going to get into in the podcast. But why don't you tell our listeners how you were forced to or asked to play bass sure. one lonely night? Sure, so I actually started playing guitar when I was about 13, 12 or 13, and really wasn't, I mean, I was aware of bass players. There were bass players that I loved listening to, but I really didn't pay a great deal of attention to it. I became a bass player because you and Rick are cousins and neither one of you were leaving the damn band. So my only way in was, <laughs> well, actually that's not true. Cause I, we tried the drum thing. There was a, there was a time where right. um, I tried out on drums once that went fine until I actually had to keep time. And that fell apart. <laughs> I play roles and you guys are like, wow, this is not bad. Then we actually started a song just all over the place. So that didn't work. And then first bass player quit and you guys had already hired a second one. So I didn't get a chance. Second and we had bass- a rule. We had a rule, never cancel a gig. Correct. No well, matter. And by the way, we played some gigs without full band members because we were that, sometimes we were too dedicated to the cause, right? Well, there was, there was definitely a drive and that was part of what, what attracted me. I, I, to, to circle back a little and why did I want in this band, it, you know, uh, a friend of mine had seen you guys first. I think I, I think she saw your second or third gig ever and said, Greg, that had to be nasty. Well, it, clearly not because her, her answer to me was, Greg, you've got to see this band. It's what you're trying to do. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, I, I'd grown up and I was listening to a bunch of the garbage stuff I used to, I was, I really wanted to try to figure out how to play guitar like Ted Nugent. And Mm -hmm. even then I recognized that his lyrics were garbage. Right. And when I started, when I first was exposed to punk, I'm like, all of a sudden, wait a minute, these lyrics aren't stupid. It's not, you know, misogynistic garbage. And it really pulled me in. So that's what I was trying to do. So that backs up to when uh, Sandy told me, you know, brought me down to see you guys. And I'm like, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And it became less important to me I was, I was still trying to create my own band. I was still trying to, to build something that I could be proud of, but it became as important to me to try to figure out how to be part of what you guys were doing. So when the second bass player quit and I had seen you guys enough that I knew most or all of the parts, I had, I had a good ear. And so the specific way, hold on. Greg says he has a good ear. Greg was easily the best musician in the toll and could pick up on anything and play it within moments where let's just say that I struggled a bit in those things. But yes, you have a natural inclination to that. It so should the second be bass player... Saying what you just said, it should be also said that there are times that that really frustrated the guys because they were working on something that they thought was really good and I would walk in from having poured coffee and go, uh, guys, 
That's a journey song. You know, <laughs> I could pick out the progressions and you don't hear them, you know, when you're, you're creating them, it's too close to you. Or when and you're it, ignorant to music. Yeah. And, and oddly enough, rare was the occasion where my fellow bandmates said, Greg, you know, you're correct. That is a great observation. And thank you for bringing that to us. <laughs> it was, it was somewhat, uh, somewhat crisper perhaps. Yes, yes. Uh, so anyway, so trying to get to a gig in, in Kent and it we was, were the band was because we correct. weren't going to cancel. Correct. And it was the next day. And I was in there. I had auditioned. And foolishly, I played guitar for all those years using a pick. Okay. Mm -hmm. So foolishly, as a bass player, I thought you played with your fingers. Mm -hmm. So I tried to play using a borrowed bass, you know, picking with my fingers. And it, and it, wasn't, it wasn't precise. It's, it's something you have to get to be able to do. And I hadn't put any time into it. So... You know, it didn't matter that the left hand was on. The right hand was... Right. So it didn't, it didn't work. So we, being you, had settled on who the bass player was going to be to get through this gig. And at the time, one of the few covers that the band ever did, we covered the Clash's version of Police and Thieves. Hmm. And there's a section in there with a kind of unusual hesitation in the bass. And... Seminon. Yep. And the guy that was the designated, you know, player for tomorrow... <laughs> couldn't get that turnaround. He couldn't, you know, I'm saying he couldn't find the timing on it. And I'm sitting there, sitting next to him, banging on his leg where the notes are supposed to be, trying to get him to, to see it. And he can't. So you guys all walk into the other office uh, where the coffee pot was. We're practicing at the time in the pinball where Correct. You guys walk up and he's still struggling to get it. And from the way you guys told this to me later, you're in the other room pouring coffee going, I don't know that we can do this. It was 10 or 11 at be, night. Yeah, I don't know that he's going to be able to do this in time. And then all of a sudden you heard the part perfect. And you all kind of looked at each other, wait, heard it again. And then you went, you know, charging back darting. and opened the we room, went charging darting. back into the other room and see me handing the bass and the pick back to him going, that's all you got to do. And you all kind of looked at each other and said, can we talk to you for a moment? <laughs> do you think you're going to be able to do this? And he said, you guys should try this with Greg playing with pick. Okay. And so we did. So that's we how you through, got into the tall. Yeah, we went through five songs without a hitch. That was also the first night I ever drank coffee. <laughs> because True we, story. I, the way I recall it is we basically stayed up the, the rest of the night going through songs. And the show was the, because we don't cancel gigs, the show was the next night. You never left the band since. It was at JB's downstairs. Yes. Uh, downstairs loading. And I remember that I barely moved because I was so... I was concentrating so hard on trying to keep, because you guys had had two fantastic bass players before me. Mm -hmm. And then you dropped They were very talented. Yeah, they yes. were talented. Uh, well, yeah, they were, they were great musicians. And then you dropped in a random hammer-handed <laughs> moron guitar player. <laughs> and I stood, uh, you know, my, I don't think my feet moved the entire time. I was basically panicked. And the thing You were like was a typist weird, oh, yeah, staring at your hands. Exactly. And the thing that was weird about that gig was the bass that I borrowed yeah. was an older model from the 60s, and the tuning keys actually worked backwards Of on course. It. Make so, it a little bit more complicated. So every time I had to tune, it was a full 10 count before I was afraid to touch anything because <laughs> I knew I was going to go the wrong way. Right. So then you were thinking, okay, I can't turn the wrong way. I have to turn the right way, which is the wrong way. And in fact, you made me wear a shirt of yours because I didn't have anything that fit the look of the toll. That's correct. I dressed everybody. You had the the black... Nothing's changed. Snap button... It was like a like a cowboy pattern yeah. thing with a you do like a little this, western and punk you cut the feel. sleeves off yeah. and that's what I wore and I exposed and the, your arms for the first time when I realized there was negative muscle and you went that man has never seen the sun above the elbows in his life and <laughs> nor a weight that, correct <laughs> hadn't seen but that a hell of, but a hell of a bass player that's uh, all that mattered well so that's a great story now let's talk about uh, go back to your words you know, that you were just talking about bass and and the other day when we spoke about this you used a very interesting word you you kept using the word underpinning about a bass acting as a bridge in a band and kind of keeping everything together and that you said you know brad if you look at bass players at their personal brand on stage many times they aren't moving the same way a guitar player or a lead singer is uh like there's this umbilical cord between the drummer for our listeners who aren't musicians between the drummer and the bass and the, and the bass player is highly responsible for that bridge back to the, the heartbeat of the brand with the drums, right? And the word that you used was, has to, you know, you, you kept saying groove and lock, groove and lock. And I love 
you knowing your guitarist background that you were using that phrase with me. Tell me from a why you think from a bass player's point of view as a brand, as an expert brand inside of a band, why you think that even the bass player's physicality is influenced by this idea of groove and lock. Well, the funny thing about it is, is I didn't even actually recognize that at the time. I knew, and if you, you probably remember, there were times where you guys were trying to encourage me, that means pressure, to, you know, to be more intense on stage, more, more, more physically mobile mm -hmm. uh, within, within the gig set. And I, I struggled to do that. And, and it took a while for me to really lock, you know, and I felt like, I mean, obviously I played hard. I mean, you've seen, you know, the bass, the Stingray that I have, you know, I bought it brand new and it's trashed. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's beautiful obviously though, I had a, because of that. Oh, to, 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 I earned every one of those. Right. Um, you know, very definitely, you know, I certainly had a heavy right hand. I certainly was playing with intensity, but I didn't move that way. And I never really, I mean, I started to, and I started to get some more motion in, but I never really locked it in. And it wasn't till afterwards, after the band had broken up, and I started mm. playing guitar again when I realized, you know, I kind of went, wait a minute, why am I moving so much more? You, you know, why am I not thinking about this? And, and what I realized was it was because to hold down the groove, you have to physically be part of the groove as well. You can't, you can't be flailing all over the place outside of what the rhythm of what the bass and the drums have to do. And once I realized that, I'm like, I could have saved myself so much stress had I figured this out <laughs> 20 years ago. And, but but that's very much it. And you look at, you, if you think about the bass players that you watch and that you love, you know, obviously John Entwistle made an entire brand out of it with them, you know, calling in the ox. And, mm -hmm. you know, the joke is that the man never moves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but if you think about bass players, you don't think about them being the most right. physically intense guy. Even Paul Simonon, who we both the love. The Clash. You know, he was, you know, there's an interview of him saying, not I wanted to be John Entwistle, but I wanted to be Pete Townsend. You know, to be the physicality, you talk about the visual physicality, that's that's your singer and your guitar player. You don't see that from the bass player. And I really think that's because of the fact that to really be an effective bass player and really live within the groove of what any given song is giving you, you can't be that physically busy because you've got to be tied in to where the drums are. You right. have to maintain that. So you have to live in the reality of who you are and what your role is in the band. Yeah, I think that is a great point. And it's funny, of all those things that you brought up, uh, when we were talking about Ent Whistle and Simonon being oppositional in a way, in just their physical styles, and Ent Whistle's right hand, you know, his, you know, flipping of the right hand and the fingers always moving. And then you have Simonon being captured by who was it, Penny Smith on the Penny cover? Smith, yeah, yeah, on the cover of London Calling with that distorted, beautiful picture. And there we're seeing action. You know, now of course he's crashing. You know, he's not playing it as you would you would probably argue. He's kind of not. He's kind of <laughs> not playing it. But the point is, that was the the first time that I remember in rock and roll where it's the bass guitar that is taking on a focal point in an image that is becomes the the book cover, if you will, the album cover of one of the top five albums of all time, according to Rolling Stone magazine. Exactly. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about was your early influences in bass and what bass means, again, as not only an instrument, but what does bass mean as, as a brand itself? We were just talking about Rolling Stone magazine. Rolling Stone magazine in 2021 uh, put out a list of the ranking the best bass players of all time. And James Jamerson was, of course, number one. And I know because you were a new student to the bass, as you've just told the story on the podcast now, you had to make up time. You had to go back and restudy this new instrument, this new ax that you had. You had to go back and restudy it and say, okay, well, I didn't start here. I started on a guitar. I have transitioned to bass. And so how did you discover James Jamerson and what impact did he have on you as a bass player? Well, I'll say first that James Jamerson set my world on fire when I knew who he was and when I discovered him. And, and the way that happened was we had had a day off in Tampa. So we went to Epcot and we decided to drink the world. A lot of people do that. The foolish thing that we did was decided that we were musicians so we could drink lots of things in each part of the world. So I remember nothing past Morocco. Um, <laughs> 
And before God and man, I have no idea how we survived to get back to Tampa. I don't know if we, somebody got smart and stopped drinking, but I woke up before you guys and the hotel curtains were still closed and everything. And, and I pulled out a phone book and there was a music store about 10 blocks away. So I decided I was going to walk over there. And I went in and none of the instruments interested me that they had there. But I was looking at the rack of magazines and there was a guitar player magazine with a bass player on the cover. And that in and of itself was weird. And so I bought it and I read it on the way back and I'm reading about James James. And this entire, most of the magazine was about Jamerson. There was a book that had just been released called Standing in the Shadows of Motown by a guy who called himself Dr. Licks. His name was actually Alan Slutsky. I can see why he changed, he changed it to Dr. Um, Licks. And he would do books like, you know, here I'm going to teach you how to all, uh, play all the guitar parts on this record. Well, this is the first book he ever did about bass. And I'm reading about Jamerson, and I read the magazine all the way back. I read it three more times that day, and I just totally enthralled by this guy. So Motown worked on a core of studio musicians when right. they were in Detroit. And it was the and same guys And this is the 60s played, when Jamerson was there. So correct. almost every chartable hit from Motown, whose fingers are on that bass? Like 95% right. or more of their number ones is James And Jamerson. they didn't list the players they, back nope, then, right? No, no, it was all about the the bands or the all about the vocalists because right. they were vocal groups. Right. And that time was different certainly from what, what we did where we wrote our songs and we did our things. You know, at that time, the producers brought in the song in whichever the Motown artist they thought best fit a song. And they would bring that in and then the musicians were always there. And here's the chord charts and these guys had run through something two or three times and then they'd start playing. And within two or three takes, you have the hits that you still listen to to Today. this day. And originally, they weren't writing out bass lines. Jamerson improvised all those things by the second or third time through just off reading the chord charts. And it's, I don't talk about a lot of things with this much passion because of what this guy, how he changed my life. And I mean, it's, it's it, it, virtuosity beyond anything. And even, you know, we talk about John Entwistle. He didn't know who James Jamerson was, but he knew it was all the same guy. He talked about, you know, oh, so he didn't know that Jamerson, yeah. he didn't know him no. by name, but he could tell by all those Motown hits because Correct. he's an artist of the bass. Correct. That, that, that the same guy was playing that. He talked about that guy that plays for Tamla, which was the name of the Motown label in England. In England, yeah. You know, uh, McCartney learned from Jamerson. You know, they all listened to that stuff. You know, Bill Wyman, I mean, they covered Motown songs. Right, right. You know, they all were listening to him. And Motown, you can you can understand from a business standpoint, mm -hmm. they don't want to tell anyone who the musicians exactly. are. They don't want another label to come and get Jamerson. That was their secret weapon. So, exactly. And so, you know, and I started after we talked yesterday, I started to rewatch the movie Standing in the Shadows of Motown, which interviews a bunch of the old Motown artists. And they, they talk at one point to Joe Hunter, who I had the privilege to meet. He played at a club downtown. I didn't know. And I went, and like, I didn't, I didn't even care what he was playing. I'm like, he played with James. I right. got I to I go. Right. And in between his sets, I just went up to him. And I said, if it's okay, sir, I just like to shake the hand of a guy who worked with my favorite bass player ever. That's he awesome. Leans over, he puts his hand in my forearm. He goes, so you a Jameson man. And I'm like, that almost made me cry. Right. Just because, you know, I don't even, you know, I, I was, I would say I was a serviceable bass player. I don't, I would not say I was an innovative anything. Mm -hmm. um, I disagree. You know, to even hear, well, you're, it's because you are. It's because I, I like you. I started listening to Motown constantly. I know this. It's, you know. Especially it, after you hurt your knee. Well, in fact, our sound man, Bill, made me a cassette of the Temptations best hits on one side. Why you're in an alt tops, punk band the in other. the 80s. I just want Correct. to make that clear to everybody. Correct. He's in and, an alt punk band in the 80s inspired by the Sex Pistols and the Clash and the Who, right? And now you're totally into Motown and Temptations. Uh, in between records. This is in between the first record and the second record. Correct. 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 So... You know, it just, you know, I went in for my knee surgery and I'm in there for three days and you I'm just on listening Valium, to though, these cassettes. Well, they had, I had a Valium drip. You had a drip. The, the drip was the weirdest thing. It was like so Pavlovian. It would beep when it actually gave you, you know, so, but it's limited. You can't have it any more than t every 10 minutes. So I'm sitting here, you know, you hear the beep, but you're on Valium. So you know, concept of time. <laughs> so, you know, like 14 <laughs> seconds after it beeps, um, the thumb's working again. And, and it, when I left, literally, 
All right, I remember my visiting thumb, the you. The ball of my hand was bigger. I know because I'd done nothing but exercise well, my that, thumb for three that days. That was your Jamerson. That that was your that was your that secret was the thing. It was a grip. Yeah. It was a grip thing <laughs> on the neck. But yeah, so he totally and and if you listen to things on the second record, I can tell you and some demos that we did that that never got recorded. Panic Bar, that song, my bass, and that exists because of him. Uh, the bass in Struggle exists because I listened to Jamerson. Understanding the groove of that is why it's not as Jamerson-esque in, I mean, let me rephrase that. It's not as blatant a ripoff of Jamerson as the other two I just mentioned, but even One Last Wish, mm -hmm. understanding how to find a groove there is because I listened to nothing but Motown and, and revisited everything. Well, your influence of Motown, like Rick's influence in the blues, you know, because he was totally into the almonds, I think, at the time. Yep. I'm just thinking of our musical arches as we grew up inside the band. Your, I mean, on our tracks, American Mess, uh, One Last Wish, Boys Are Busting Bricks, even Parts to Me of Never Enough, that's all influenced. Your bass playing is, to me, all influenced in bringing Motown into, you know, our way, Jamerson-isms into our way of playing alt-rock at the time. I even think that uh, your ability to signal out vocal melodies, like uh, one of our track releases on the second record was a, a song called Hear Your Brother Calling, where we actually carried forward the narrative style. And you came up with that, with the chorus hook of that song. And I think that whole musicality, I don't think it just, I, I don't think the Jamerson brand just influenced your bass playing. I think it influenced your musicality in general. Would you agree? Yes. And it's, it's interesting that you, that you point out the vocal thing, not so much with that, with that specific example, because that was more of a, you know, like hearing a thing, but you know, as I was listening to Motown and as anyone listens to Motown, you hear those fantastic harmonies that they would do. And, you know, you got those groups of people that are specifically together because of the way their voice is playing. And I have always listened to records and sung harmonies. I don't sing. If I'm listening to a chorus, I don't sing the main line. I, in my head, I'm finding the harmonies and I'm listening to those and, and, and doing those. So I definitely started to bring some of those things you and did. have suggestions in there. And that's absolutely because of that as well. I mean, you can't listen to Smokey Robinson and the Miracles and not hear the vocal harmonies and and hear that and have that influence you if you're a musician you you can't you can't listen to four tops and not have that get into your soul right right and and you uh reminded me that when you first played i think it was bernadette and uh, i think the phrase you used was um you know this desperate passion that's inside the vocal delivery there and that influenced me and Again, when I talk about banding and branding, you know, a brand is comprised of its collective parts. And so while Rick is into country and I might have been into just pure poetry at the time, and Rick is listening to the Almonds or country music, and Brett is listening to Elton John, and you're listening to Motown. Of course, people say, I, I used to love after a show, people would say, well, you guys have really changed since the first record. Well, yeah, what do you want me to do? <laughs> it's because what? I sat in a studio for two years and wrote songs. <laughs> I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> oh, the opportunity, <laughs> Kennison. I love Kennisoning. <clears throat> That's a whole other brand. <laughs> but, but my point here is, is that brands are influenced by the experts that author them, like a great leadership team. And in a band, the way we ran the band, there were four parts. So, of course your Motown came through. And I, I think about now that we're having this conversation, I guess I've never really thought about it, but that's the, again, the background vocals, one of my favorite background vocals and the whole vibe of American Mess, with, especially with that song title and those background vocals. I loved it when you did that because that was a totally different flavor than we've ever had. So let me ask you this next question about bass. Who do you think so, Jamerson, you would say, obviously, Rolling Stone agrees with you. Number one, the benchmark of the brand of bass. You would agree? Absolutely. Let me ask you this. Who since then, or any other time, who do you think has brought bass as a big rhythm part 
of the component of brand forward in musicality. I can't think of a bunch of guys, certainly no one that's had the impact that, that Jamerson did because, you know, the people that you look at in the aftermath are all building on what he did. You know, McCartney was certainly unbelievably melodic. John Entwistle with that, that aggressively muscular style. Uh, Flea is a great bass player. Now, he, um, he brought the bass brand forward. Yes, and you can hear him. Red Hot Chili Peppers, a, for those who don't know. Yeah, you can, you can hear him. There are other songs that he's played on for other artists, and you hear it, and you're like, of, well, of course that's him. You know, I mentioned to you the other day, Bust a Move. Um, yeah, of course I that's mean, him. And he's in the when video, you said that, I started smiling. Because as soon as you hear it, if you didn't know it, you if better you know the know baseline. It. You go, of course. It it's like Ant Whistle knowing. It's it's like Ant Whistle knowing Jamerson didn't know his name, but yeah. he knew that guy's that guy. Exactly. Same with Flea. Exactly. There are certainly a ton of of bass players that have been influential in their areas. It's it, there's just not that many guys that I'm directly aware of mm-hmm. because if I think of the bass players that I listen to, mm-hmm. you know, it's the two we mentioned, and then uh, we also talked about. Uh, uh, he called himself Mysterious from the Rosillos. Had that fantastic, muscular, punchy sound. Yes, but I like, did listen like to that sound. It's whistle, incredible, but, isn't it? It's, it's incredible. It's, so, just a just a backstory. So, this guy played in a band. They were a Scottish punk band called the Rosillos. They released one record as the Rosillos. Right. And I heard that record, and just the sound. I kept telling our sound man. How do I sound like that? I want to sound like that. Make me sound like that. Of course, I couldn't play like that, so it didn't really better, but that was, you know, that was, so those were kind of my guys, you know, certainly and very much not in my genre, but the bass player for Chic mm. certainly was a trend setting and record setting yes, guy. But yes. I don't know that up until Jamerson exploded the world in R&B and then all of a sudden everybody had to have a guy that played like him. I don't know. Somebody probably would have done it, mm-hmm. but I think all of the deeply groove-driven creative bass players in certainly in that genre, I think they all, whether they know it or not, have their roots in in him. I think he very much planted the seed that caused the whole tree to grow. Wow. Um, I mean, that's a huge, that's a, so would you say, so let's take Eddie Van Halen. Okay. With what he invented on the guitar. His pull off and tapping, right? That that we have all read the history that he hit it from the A and R guy. He would turn his back to people trying to figure out what the hell he was doing, right? Yep. Would you say then, because lead singers and guitars are, let's just say that people listen to them more, right? You listen to a melody. Oh, they uh, do. I'm not hurt. I'm not offended. Right, right. (laughs) And so, you know, I've introduced people who aren't musicians. Like I'll say to Symphony, "Well, you hear the bass line that." Well, now I know that that's her favorite thing is listening to the bass and songs. And she didn't really even know that that was what she was tracking. Do you think that Jamerson had an impact on bass playing as the same way that Eddie did on changing how a guitar could be played? Absolutely. Really? Absol- absolutely. Well, I, I don't even, I didn't almost didn't even let you finish the sentence. Absolutely. You know, he was, I believe he was that revolutionary. And because, you know, here's, here's what I'll tell you. Go back and listen to any song that was was on the top 10 in 1959 or 1960 and listen to the bass and you're going to find it's real basic roots and fifths you know doom, 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 doom. it's, it's going to be it's going to be very basic and then listen start roots and watching, fifths baby yeah, roots and fifths and start watching once motown started charting yeah and listen to bass lines after you're that. so right and what i want everyone to understand if you've never made a rock and roll record is like putting your life underneath a tiny microscope and all you hear when you make a record is every single thing that you do is a mistake it is hard to make a record. It's easy to play live. Maybe I'm crazy, but that's my world. <laughs> no, I'm laughing because I'm revisiting the mental terror of recording Smoke Another Cigarette. Exactly. But my point is, this means during Motown, they would do 10, 12, 15 songs a day. He's doing that 10 times a day, every day. And he can't, you brought this up, he can't take what he just played for artist X and play it 15 minutes late on artist Y, even though they're both in E minor. He can't, right? So he has to do something extremely creative. 
And that's why you don't hesitate when I make the comparison between what Van Halen did on the guitar and what he did on the bass. Exactly. That's brand changing. It's not just changing an instrument. That's changing the way you look at writing music. Yeah. I mean, think about, imagine us trying to write three songs in three totally different feels in well, I can already with, tell you with three forty-five too many. minutes <laughs> with, within like forty-five minutes too before many. we have to do the next one, right? Because that's literally what these guys were doing. And you know, you look at those, you look at pictures from that time; they're all in the room, right? You know, I know. Stevie Wonder is up front; they're all in that. It's room. like Sun Studios, and I and I will tell you, I told you this yesterday. I've walked in that room, and it's twenty-six forty-eight West Grand. If you're ever in Detroit and you love do music, it. you got to go. It's, uh, it's just it's. Unbelievable. Talk about a brand. Um, and you walk in there and the same piano's there and Pistol Allen's drums are in the corner and all that stuff that you've heard happened right there and it all happened within 20 or 30 minutes of the first time they'd ever seen it. Right. You know, so you go from literally in the same day you could record My Girl, then you could record I Was Made to Love Her, then you could record Tears of a... Nope, Tears of a Clown is different. That was actually a demo track. That's a long... That's a quick story. That was actually recorded by Stevie Wonder and his band. He couldn't figure out what to do it. He gave the track entirely, the musical track, to Smokey. And Smokey went, oh, I know what it is. And he built that. So, sorry, that was a different thing. But No, but that's a great point. Your point is it all happened in that room very quickly because that is the level of their expertise and talent to do that. Day exactly. after day after day with no recognition individually. Right, so he none whatsoever. He he couldn't build his personal brand until after his death, really. That's right? that's true. You could could you imagine today in social media what Jamerson could have done? So let's such let's, a different world. Such a different world. Back then it was in a room, and now it's streaming. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's move to something else that you and I have both known is this idea of, you know, banding to branding to business building. And one of the things that you pointed out to me that took me aback, I know it, but took me aback of how correct you were when we were discussing this. And that is, it's not just about being in a band. Like Motown was Motown. It wasn't just Jamerson. There's a whole brand behind that idea, right? Correct. You said that one of our biggest mistakes, because I want to I want to put this back in the branding world for a second, because I thought what you said was profound. You said our biggest mistake was we were born as a brand being live. That's what we did. Making up the words every night, you guys improvising entire sections of music. Sometimes we would just do interim little songs that we hadn't rehearsed because there weren't, it wasn't really a song. Right. It was just a part, but we would do it as a tune, right? Mm -hmm. Some nights we would play for 30 minutes long, 35 minutes long, a single song and just walk off stage because that's what we wanted to do. But you said to me, we were a live band and between the first record and the second record, our biggest mistake as a brand was that we stayed inside the warehouse and wrote, I don't know how many songs you probably do know. Two or 3,000. I don't know. It felt no, like it, sometimes. We, we demoed something like 50 or 60 songs. Yeah, we almost, we almost demoed. That's what I thought it was. Well over 50 songs. And you said as a brand, our biggest, the, the reason we shouldn't have done that is because we pulled ourselves away from the energy of the brand, not the band, the brand. And that we, the energy came from the crowd. It came from understanding connection in a live moment. And we're trying to write a second record. You said, well, Brad, it's about banding and branding and business. It's not just about being a great musician. Right. And it, so the thing, the thing that was foolish of us is that we existed we got the notice that we did because of what we did live. Everything that we, everything we wrote in the warehouse, we tested live. And then we came home and changed it if we needed to. We found mm -hmm. what worked. We, we tested it in that crucible. Yeah, it's, of called, it's, on stage. it's called market testing. Exactly. I would prefer to think of it as playing live, but you can call it that. It's okay. market testing doesn't look as good on the flyer. Okay. But <laughs> it's a little um, long, Brad. Come see the toll market test. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> so, so what we, 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 f we confirmed what we thought worked. Right. Our instincts. We confirmed what, how it worked together and how it flowed by putting it in front of people, but also by playing it live in that atmosphere. Right. It just feels different. And by not doing that for that amount of time, 
we got away from creating the way we always created. And that's why, I mean, we wrote a lot of songs there that I think there are bits of great stuff. Mm -hmm. And we wrote a lot of songs that I listened to and I just don't know. Because we were off. That's what you said. We were off brand. You have to be true to who you are and what created you. Um, Like Disney, like Disney, like Levi's, like Cadillac. Exactly. You have to be, this is who you are. This is what you created of you. If you, if you veer from that, if you grow from that, it still has to have roots in who you are and what you, what you believe yourself to be and what others believe you to be. Okay. So let me ask you, I love that what you believe yourself to be and what others believe you to be, your customers, your fans in this case, and that fan information is everything, right? It's called market research. Sorry. But that feedback loop is critical to leadership, yeah. right? At Wheels Up, they have a feedback loop. At Disney, they have a feedback loop. You've got to know what the customer loves and wants. Yep. Correct? So with that being said, what as a band, what bands do you think or what one comes to mind that you think, hey, these guys have done a great job in that feedback loop with their fans, with their customers, listening to the customer as they grow album after album after album. Is there a band that comes to mind that you think's done a good job at this? That's an interesting question. I don't have a definitive answer to your question just because where was the chicken and where was the egg? Right. Did they did they decide I'm doing this because it's different and this is who I am? Did they decide this is what we do and it fits and it just worked? I mean, it's, it's a little or hard to- Or did they to- say our crowd wants to hear this? And you know, sometimes, sometimes you can listen to that feedback loop so much that you do lose your brand essence. Yes. Right. And, and we, back in the day in the warehouse, we would call that, you know, those people, you know, the people who have sponsorship money, they're sell, they, they sell out. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and those bands lose their way. And so that's why I'm bringing that up. Cause I, I think when you said that to me, I think we were losing our way and you, oh, no you, question. you used the word mistake. You said we made a mistake and, oh, the, no question. And, and the mistake was like any brand, we weren't listening to our customers. Well, and we, the other thing that we did poorly, and I think this probably, uh, this probably dovetails into what you're saying is we brought no new influence into the creative time zone. You know, we spent our entire day in the warehouse together, unless maybe occasionally you went to lunch with your dad. Other than that, we were in the warehouse Working. the entire day. We were workaholics. We couldn't, we couldn't start rehearsing until five o'clock because there was an actual business next to us and right. rock and roll and being in the phones don't mix. So, <laughs> so we had all the same influences through the day. And then we picked up our instruments at 501 and we tried to bring exactly the same influences to exactly the same right. space in exactly the same room. But the point is innovation. Every brand has to innovate, whether, right? Whether it's Casper, Samsung, it's all about innovation. And that innovation, to your point, comes from outside sources. Right. And you do that. There's actually a great story that one of the guys from, um, from Sony would encourage guys to stay at home for a week and yep. just play around with stuff. Yep. Because that's how they found new innovation. If exactly. everybody tried to create in the same space, that's your point. Nobody saw anything new. Exactly. That's exactly, exactly. And the same thing. you hold on. The problem with innovation that is sterilized, which is what we were doing, whether it's in art or business, you hold on to ideas that may indeed just be bad. Yeah. And you hold on to them because you work so hard on them instead of doing what's right for the band, the business, or the brand. And that's dropping your ego. And letting innovation come, like you say in the, in, the, in the Sony example, letting innovation come from the outside in. Now, Keith Richards says that a great song writes itself. Exactly. And, and so does Westerberg. you can never force a child to be what it's not. Right. And well, we example, know that. Oh, God, we tried. <laughs> and the example, the perfect example is Start Me Up. They did hundreds of attempts with that song as a reggae song. And the way it is that we know it today they tried it once and all of a sudden they went like yeah. this and they realized because they were trying to force the baby to be something it wasn't. Yes, yes. And that song specifically to me, I think is still one of the greatest guitar riffs of all time. And it's so bloody simple. Well, you'll have it's to teach me so, off mic. Don't well, do it now. Don't do it now no, because I'll didn't, fail. Didn't, didn't mean it that way. I mean, but it's not but, Brad simple. I mean, it's, it's physically mean in general, simple, but I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, you listen to it. It's, it's two chords. 
And every time you hear that, you hear it in a stadium. Doo, 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 I know. You, you know what's coming. Huge song. Now, there was some things from a brand standpoint that we did well as a band that I have taken with me for many years. And you brought this up and stated that we played in 22 states before we were actually signed. We did it ourselves. And without a manager. And without a manager. It was our own drive. Because we created a business that we operationalized from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then rehearse from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. and then eat a sandwich. And then run to bumpers before they close. And run to bumpers before they close to share a sub sandwich and a pitcher of beer. Next day comes, lived like that for every day for years, right? Absolutely. Every day, Saturday, Sunday, didn't matter the day. Absolutely. And that's the real reason that work ethic is the real reason that we had any success. Because, you know, we, we looked early on and saw that there were a lot of bands playing mostly in, in their hometown, in our case, Columbus. And when, you're, when your goal is to play on campus on this night of the week, and then next week you play in the north side, your entire tour base is, you know, a 30-mile wide circumference. And there's no sustainability there. You can't, the same people are not going to come see you four times a week in all that different place. And it's naive to think that, only campus people will come see you on campus and only if your fans will go see you until you've burned them out. Right. So you have to create a new so market. You have to go, you have to go new places. You have to try new things and you have to get into new environments in order to be able to grow. And you know, there, there's that calendar that we used as a flyer from a January. And I think it was 86, uh-huh. you know, out of the, the days of the month, I think we had 23 gigs that month or 24. Mm-hmm. And that was all driven by, that was all driven by, you know, continuing to expand the footprint because we want to play live and we can't do it all here. So we got to go more places. We got to do more things. And that goes into the divisions of what we did. Divisions of labor. Exactly. That was our leadership team. Exactly. And how did we grow? Okay, you're going to do this thing. You know, truck never had problems because Rick nailed it. And break down the position. So I was like emotional CEO right? With the label and things like that before that. And just the, the face of the, the brand, right. you, your role was, I was a press guy. You were a great press guy. All I had to do was talk to people, man. It was easy. <laughs> you yeah, got but, us but, press. We had nothing. And you got us press. You, you did a great job. Was, and was, and so what did Mayo do quickly? He, the drummer. He was, he was the money guy. He was the money. He was the CFO. And Rick was chief operational officer. Transportation, right? getting, you know, finding and human the truck resources. In shape, get, uh, right? We were all kind of human resources. Yeah, I yeah. think we all found Milton and Bill and. Right. And, or Mayo did after too many rolling rocks. Well, <laughs> you know, I think Mayo is the one who talked Milton into coming down. Yeah. But, you know, all those, all those guys, Marty and, and uh, Mike Malice and, and obviously Kerr was already here. Mm-hmm. You know, all those guys. These are all our, who, this is all our road. Our road crew team yeah, that Greg's and, mentioning. And and I want to say all these guys, with the exception of Craig Mathis, who we call Kerr, they all moved from other cities to come work with us because they believed in what we were doing. Yes. And we only found those guys, again, because we got out on the road. Yes, to your point. So we built this leadership team and we never left those roles. I mean, no one ever came to you and said, I mean, we would have band meetings where we, they weren't band meetings. They were actually brand meetings. You know, if you think we did, about we didn't ha- We didn't have the R then. We didn't, have, right, the we didn't R. have the R. We didn't have the R. Mm-hmm. But we had leadership meetings about, hey, what's the forwarding on press is going like, Greg? Where are we at? And Rick, how are we doing operationally? Whether it's guitar techs or do we need this part on transportation logistics, right? Yep. And with Mayo, how much money is left in the bank? We talked about the, well, what bank, but we, how much money's left in the upper drawer, (laughs) but we talked about these things as business guys. And then we would strap on instruments at five o'clock. And I am saying that, uh, and you hear this all the time. There are many, many, we, 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 we didn't invent that. There are many, many bands uh, at that level who, who get to a level of success signed or otherwise that do the same thing very, very well. Well, and I think that's what creates a lot of those success stories. I mean, the guys in Watershed. It's not just the them. music. No, no. It's, you know, the guys in Watershed here in Columbus looked at our 
model. footprint and the fact that that's what we went out and did and that's what they went out and did. Right. You know, they, you know, they did it because they saw it work, not because they went, you know, I want to be just like those no, guys. No, I know, I know. They, I know. they did it because it worked. Other bands have done that exact same thing. You don't, you know, it is rare that you succeed purely on creativity. Now, having said that, today there's so much more access with, you know, the internet and band camp and so many other things. There's There are other avenues, but for us, it was break it live or... Or go you know, home. Or exactly. Or quit the dream. Or stay home. Or stay home. Break yeah. it live or stay home. Right, right, right. Let's talk about your bass playing specifically. That should be a short conversation. <laughs> Were you any good? No. Thank you. Next. Rick and I have discussed this on a previous podcast. And that is what I said earlier, that you were the best musician in the band. Um, I know you would argue differently with your humility, and that's great. But I want to talk about how your bass playing and expertise changed from album one to album two. And I want to bring up one song to do that. It's a song that is about uh, some things economically that were going, in and down, going on in downtown Columbus, actually, at the time, um, which was displacing homeless people for urban renewal right? And so we wrote a track called Boys Are Busting Bricks. And it was a very, how can I say it? Aggressive. It was a little, 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 little scratchy, a little pushy. <laughs> a, an aggressive tune. And you, that bass line and the hook, everything follows your bass in that song. Which is funny because you may or may not remember the writing process on that, but we, we kind of had, this was one of those, gosh, Greg, surely there's something better moments. Um, <laughs> And the reason was because Rick's guitar parts, Rick's progression was longer. And I, oh, had, I had trouble. I do remember. Yeah. And I couldn't find something following the length of his progression that had any groove to it. And I, I, I kept saying that. And you finally said, uh, you said in a rather less than Happy. Uh, joyous moment. Well, then what do you have to do to get a groove out of it? <laughs> That's called cutting to the chase. So okay. it was a challenge. Said, it was I a said, challenge. Okay, Brett, said, Brett started playing the beat. And I thought for not very long. No. I, mean, I thought like 20 or 30 seconds. And I went, okay. Do, 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 do. And like I started watching eyebrows go up. Mm -hmm. And it's good when you're, when the eyebrows are going up, when they're going down. It's bad. You find something else quickly because, you know, the, because you just heard the tone. And you don't want to hear the next tone. Right. So, you know, you're trying to hit and, but the eyebrows went up. And then, then there was a nod. And then Rick started playing again to see if his part fit over what I was doing, which somehow miraculously, so thank God did. it did. Right. Um, and, and that's where that, Okay. That's where they came from. And what I love most about that track, again, in your growth, and you, and again, I didn't remember the challenge that I posed to you, but thank you for <laughs> oh, reminding me. I do. Me. I still see it. <laughs> and I'm sure you took out a few of the ex explicatives, right? There, there might have been some beverages handled by me in the aftermath of that. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we went to record it, now I don't know if you did it this way, in the rehearsal space, but when we actually went to record that track with Wallace on the second record, this is when you introduced me to, and maybe it happened prior to this, but it was that song that formatively int introduced me to what was called a five-string bass. So, of course, now there's six-string basses, and there's tons we can do digitally today that gives us that big boom, boom that you hear, right? But when you added, it's a low B is what it is up on top, and you were using what kind of bass then? Uh, that was my music band Stingray. That's right. Five string. I got the second one in Columbus. And it sounds, when you guys hear a low B on a track like that, you can never go back to an E. <laughs> I mean, I know this sounds like We just like go a, to the E on the way down to the B. I, it's, it's a transition. I piece. know this sounds like a spinal tap moment. <laughs> this one goes to 11. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> once I heard B. that B, that B, I would say to Greg in every song, well, I, now I wanted it in every song, right? But it, it and that's did. true. He really did. There were there were many conversations. But it but it but it didn't work. And I asked you, looking back now, and still when I used to play that song for the kids or to people, they'll say, "Well, what the hell is that?" Right now, of course, that's being it, it's even lower than that now. It's you know subsonic. 
But um, when you first did that, when I have people listen to that and I have the guitar and the kit, the drum kit, the guitar and the bass all locked on that, it is heaven, right? Why do you think that low B did that to that song? What, what about the song and your approach and how'd you think of it to do that? I think primarily because it, it inhabits a different sonic space than what the guitars do. Rick's, Rick's parts in that are, are higher. And, you know, you mentioned the six string bass. I, so on a six string bass, the other string is higher than what's there. And to me, that's getting into the guitar register. And, I and think, being a guitar guy, you I respect think, that. You yeah, get it. I, think, I think you need to create that, you know, if, you, if you're space. mixing a song and you put all the guitars right down the middle, you can't hear anything. It's, it's muddy. So you have, to, you have to fill up different spaces with it. And so it was a matter of, you know, wanting, wanting to have that low and, and stay out of the guitar space, but it also takes up a little bit more sonic room. So with that being a song with only one guitar, uh, it, it sort of grows and inhabits the space bigger and makes the song feel fuller. And you did that. You, and to me, when I first heard that low B, it was like another animated vocal. It, to me, it was like a vocal. Um, and, you know, we used to talk about writing songs because I knew where things were on the guitar. That's an A, that's an E. But we would usually talk about colors or feelings when we would pick notes together, right? Right. And sometimes even with background vocals, we would just say, oh, it's got to be powder blue. Or, and, you know, Hendrix did that. A lot of people have done that before using color to speak about music. And when, when I heard the color of a low B, I just said, oh my God, I found, I found, you know, earth. <laughs> I found mother earth. Right. And that's, that's what it was. Well, and the uh, space, the space, the sonic space that that occupies, it's just a difference. Another place where it is on the second record is in ledge. When we go into the break yeah. and it just going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just let that hang and you yeah. just feel the way no, that you're right. You're occupies right. A, that space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I want to bring up one other topic with you, and that is space, both in, in a band, in business, and in branding, very quickly. And that is, on the first record, I have a feeling, because of confidence, and you talked about smoking another cigarette a little bit, and because of just the attitude and the pecking order of the band, you probably didn't feel that you had enough space. Whereas on the second record, I hear that Greg has space. Well, there's, there's a Would couple of things. Would you say that's that, true? Yeah, there's a couple of things that played into that. You know, obviously, you know, coming into it, a, a, one of the things that happened on the first record, oddly enough, is that while at times I felt that uh, the producers were, were kind of not completely aware of the bass at all. Um, <laughs> you mean, oh, you, look, there's a guy there. They thought the doors, <laughs> cool. the doors were playing. Thought, Where's yeah, Manzarek's white keyboard? And, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, was, they were really very much focused on, you know, the production of of what you do and what Rick did. You know, Brett was like, okay, stay steady. And bass player was like, okay, if we, as long as we don't have to, if he doesn't jump out us, at us that something's wrong, then we can stay out. Um, there was also some some confidence issues in that too. But, you know, in the amount of time, you know, and the other thing too was the real change was broadening my own horizons and finding my own space by discovering Jamerson That's and my listening to things that weren't I mean, innovation because coming into it. You know, I, we did not need John Entwistle as a bass player. So no matter how great I thought he was, that didn't apply in this space. Um, I, there was nothing I could learn from that because his sound is so much more not just his sound, but his presence, you know, he and, and Jamerson are similar amounts of busy mm -hmm. but townsend but, gave but townsend gave him some room to do that well, well he did and and jamerson was more of, more of the melodic groove mm -hmm. as opposed to the bass as a solo instrument which it is in with the who almost percussive um, yeah absolutely um which is you know he played like that you know we talked about the hand mm -hmm. he's going he's actually playing with all four fingers twice a, like down and back up i have no idea it's how does anyone bizarre. do that it's, I have no idea. So he's trilling it backwards. Exactly. Down and up. And if you watch him on that, you know, I talked to you about that, uh, that isolation video from the Kids Are All Right movie. It's the hands going all this and it's all clearly notes going both ways. I don't know how. Um, but 
learning how the bass could be a little bit more melodic, but it gave me the awareness that bass could do things other than what I certainly I was doing with it. Because coming into it as a bass player for the Toll, my job was not to find my own right. groove it because their songs were existing. Right, right. You know, I had to come into the framework of the songs that were the the bass as a brand in the toll already existed. And they, and like you said, they were, some yeah. of them were stellar musicians. Yeah. Oh, tr- smoked me. Um, right. So, you know, it was, it was a long time until I started to be able to create. And even then I was so tentative in trying to write as a bass player that I really didn't have, I, I, I didn't have the backstory. Right. Jamerson gave me the backstory. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it is. Jamerson that's, gave me the backstory. That's beautifully said. And I just want to add to that uh, in closing that that's exactly what happens with a great brand is you have to know where, uh, and Greg and I talked about this yesterday, you have to know where your expertise is, just like Jamerson did inside Motown. You got to know what you're an expert at and, and have those around you that give you the space to be that expert. Because oftentimes in organizations and in brands, it all gets focused on the bottom line. And we forget to give one another the space to really perform. And I know that, you know, uh, I learned a lot as a leader in the toll from the first record to the second record about giving people space. So um, it was great speaking with you today. Unbelievable. Going to have you back. Uh, A real pleasure to sit down and hear your thoughts as we reflect on banding, branding, and business building.